Ladies and gentlemen, isn't this a fantastic uh, venue and a fantastic occasion? It feels like we are celebrating Spring Day, although slightly late. Um, we will start on time, that's uh, part of our ethos. Um, from our side, um, that is first of all because we are the host today, the School of Public Leadership uh, in, our, in our different guises, Stelmas Good Governance Forum and Social Novus, as well as our other very esteemed and appreciated partners, which is uh, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, um, and also the Center for Constitutional Rights. We welcome you here on the Belvoir Park campus of Stellenbosch University. We are very, very pertinent and deliberate in terms of living our philosophies. And the one tagline which is appropriate here is the tagline of conversations change conditions. If we don't talk, and it reminds me of, of an old I think Beatles song as well, which says, we don't talk anymore. There's a real need for discussion and conversation. Uh, our country is facing a number of, of, of serious challenges, uh, and in that sense, the more we can talk, the more we should talk. So on behalf of our, as I say, very appreciated partners, you are all most welcome here. And the program for today, relates to a very topical set of issues around what is happening to our state, what is happening to the whole fiber of society. Um, and for that we've got esteemed speakers, which my colleague Dr. Brandt will, will introduce. But for now, uh, it is also our privilege to introduce uh, Ms. Christina Teichmann of the Konrad Arnauer Stiftung. Uh, she has a lot of good things that you can say about her. Uh, actually mostly good things, only one slight flaw, she did a master's at UCT, which she <laughs> but Christina, we can still be friends. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, Christina, on behalf of us, we give over to you, and thanks for the generous and kind sponsorship over, over a number of years now for this very success, successful event. Thank you, Christina. Evan, I just want to correct you. This song was not, not from the Beatles. <laughs> oh, it was. It was from maybe somebody can help me. Uh, Richard. Ever Richard. Sorry, Eva. No, but anyhow, maybe I, I get to the name. <laughs> anyhow, on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you, especially to our two guest speaker, uh, Miss Morn and uh, Mr. Peter Louis Mayberg. I also would like to thank our very valued partner, the Center for Constitutional Rights and the School for Public Leadership for organizing this event, which is actually the last one in the series uh, in 2017. 2017 will go down in the memory of many South Africans as a year in which state capture became an accepted term to describe the status quo of the highest office in government, certain ministries, certain government departments, certain chapter 9 institutions, and certain peristatals. And I consciously say certain, because I want to emphasize that there are always exceptions, and that there are still institutions and individuals who have not been captured and maneuvered into a complicit and corrupt relationship with private actors. What we have witnessed over the last months is that state capture does not necessarily happen outside the law or in illegal spaces. On the contrary, it seems that state capture uses a legal space and exi existing loopholes to its full advantage in order to sideline sideline opponents or to get the right people into the right positions. However, state capture needs good planning, preparation, and execution. And wait not for the media, an alert civil society, and some people with integrity in government departments and chapter nine institutions. We, the public, might never have known the full extent of it. State capture is a threat to any democracy since it undermines democratic processes and puts private interests before the interests of the nation. We, as a Konrad Adenauer Foundation, a German political foundation affiliated to the Christian Democrats, are very much concerned about the current situation and the long-term impact that state capture has on the economy and consequently on the life of many people here in South Africa. 
On the other hand, the protests and demonstrations in front of Parliament and other places across South Africa have also shown that South Africans value this young democracy and are actually prepared to, to actively defend it. We have realized that active citizens and an independent media are crucial to fight state capture and all other kinds of corruption. Through state capture, we have learned that democracy is not a given, but that it needs constant safeguarding. With events like this one today, PAS aims to provide a platform to share information, to promote informed debate, and to nurture a culture of active citizenship. I very much look forward to your presentations, and I wish us all a fruitful morning. Thank you very much. I get so nervous talking in front of groups of people, which is weird when you consider you know, broadcast journalism and talking to a few million people, but um, nonetheless, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Um, in July this year, I went to the small village, uh, small town, mining town of Hendrin in Pumalaga. I don't know if you've ever been there. But um, I was going there to do a story about something that should have been extremely hopeful, potentially life-giving to the hundreds of residents who lived in the informal settlement in Hendrina. It was a story about a multi-million rand state-of-the-art primary health care facility, a clinic. Uh, it was the first of its kind, it would be the first of its kind to service uh, that community, and it was beautiful. It was open, full of light, a place where women could safely give birth to their children, a place where people with chronic medical conditions like HIV, TB, and something that's close to my heart because I am diabetic, diabetes, could get their medication without having to wait in long, winding queues. The most important thing, of course, was that for the first time it would offer the residents in the informal settlement a place where they could get emergency treatment. They could be stabilized if they'd been stabbed or were in a really bad medical condition. They could be stabilized before being taken on the ambulance to Middleburg, which was a 40-minute drive. And what, would, what had been happening, of course, was that people were taking taxis and were dying in the taxis because they couldn't get the emergency care. This clinic would save lives, except it didn't. That's the painful part of the whole story. That is the heartbreak. This amazing state-of-the-art facility that offered the promise of excellent health care to the poorest residents of this little mining town had stood empty for months and months and months. When I asked an elderly man on camera what he knew about why the 90% completed clinic was not in use, his answer was extremely painful and simple. He told me in Zulu, the Amagupta came and they took over the mine from Glencore. Glencore built this clinic, but now the Amagupta are fighting over money for it. And so it stands empty. <coughs> that clinic in Hendrina, you see, was more than just a beautiful empty building with the promise of everything that I've told you about. It was, and is, a monument to state capture. The story of how the Optimum Coal Mine was effectively forced into business, rescued by ESCOM, and then bought by the Gupta and Dubizana Zuma owned uh, Tegeta, has filled many, many newspapers and formed quite a significant part of the public protected Tuli Manancela State of Capture report. And I mean, if you want to read a sort of excellent insight into the whole Gupta empire, I would advise you to read Peter Louis' book, and I'm sure you'll go into a lot more detail about this. Madam Saylor documented how Glencore <coughs> seemed to have been severely prejudiced by ESCOM's actions in refusing to sign a new agreement with them for the supply of coal to the Hendrina power station. Quote, it appears that the conduct, conduct of ESCOM was solely for the purposes of for, uh, forcing Optimum Coal Mine or Optimum Coal Holdings into business rescue and financial distress, she said. ESCOM had demanded a 2.1 billion rand fine from Glencore for what it said was substandard coal. That fine was a key part of why Glencore went into, into business distress. And then ESCOM swore high and low in a number of media reports and press conferences that, it was, that, that this fine must be paid in full. Except, surprise, surprise, a month before I went to Hendrina, 
Business Day reported that ESCOM gave to get a 75% discount on that fine. So to get it was effectively asked to buy, pay 500 million rand instead of 2.1 billion. Manit Sela said that what ESCOM had done in the Tegeta deal, which included giving Tegeta a 1 billion rand prepayment before its new owners had even given them a single lump of coal, amounted to an apparent violation of the Public Finance Management Act. This conduct was seemingly driven by a desire to support the Gupta family's business ambitions. And when one learns that the Chief Financial Officer for ESCOM, Anaj Singh, allegedly received an offshore company, cash, and a now infamous 10,000 rand massage from the Guptas. His behavior in seemingly bending over backwards for the Fermi doesn't seem that strange. Amar Bungani has reported that the evidence contained in the Gupta leak email showed that how, while at Transnet <coughs> ESCOM, Singh may have assisted the family's business network to secure state contracts worth 30 billion rand. I can't put that number in my calculator, I just tried, but that's a lot of zeros. It's 12, 12 zeros after the 15. I want to pause here for a moment. In preparing for the speech, I typed, I, I went to Google and typed how much has state capture cost South Africa into, to, as a search, which was a very bad mistake. Much like when you find a rash on your foot in Google to find out what's wrong with you, you should probably not. <laughs> look for such kind of analysis. Um, it was terrifying. There's actually no number for how much state capture has cost us. Probably because, as Trudy Man and Sela recently told me when I spoke to her on Monday, looting begets more looting. And obviously looting is facilitated by getting rid <laughs> of ethical leaders and office officials who try to block it. And those removals lead to downgrade and panic and a loss of, of people who actually care about the country, who want it to be better. And that's not something that you can put into <coughs> monetary sums. In a country where 54% of our population is living on 17 rand a day, the unabated looting that we are now seeing has been described as treasonous uh, by some commentators. But I would go further than that. I would say it's actually murderous. Cancer patients in KwaZulu-Natal are reportedly being sent home with panados because there is no treatment available to them at state healthcare systems, in, state, in the state healthcare system there. An arguably captured law enforcement uh, system where brilliant police officers and prosecutors have been targeted and hounded out of their positions, cannot cope with the growing wave of lawlessness that is engulfing the country. If you have not read Jacques Poe's book, I would heartily recommend that you do, because it really goes, it will make you very, very angry, but it really describes in the most compelling detail how law enforcement, the Hawks, SARS, um, and the NPA have been effectively captured. And it's not just a political football that's being played here, it has real lived consequences for ordinary South Africans. Economic desperation and a lack of consequence have created a poisonous cocktail. Life is becoming cheaper and cheaper, and it is the poorest among us, unable to use resources to protect themselves, that are the most vulnerable. Unlike the Guptas and the President and their henchmen, there are no high walls and alarms and bodyguards to protect you when you are living in a shack. And so, what the agents of state capture have done is not a clean and bloodless act of self-enrichment. It, blo it is a bloodied and gory act of murder. Murder of our economy. Murder of real leadership murder of opportunity, and murder of any sense of hope in the lives of our poor. <coughs> outside that clinic in Hendrina, I wondered what amount of money would have prevented the Guptas from completing the remaining work on this beautiful facility. <coughs> it must be a lot, I thought, for them to do this to these people. It turned out to be about four million rand. Four million rand in the context of 30 billion rand. 
After my story aired, the Gupta's family lawyer told me that they were intent on reaching an agreement with the company that had built the clinic, as they, yet the, I still don't know if that uh, deal has been reached. I desperately want to end this speech on a note of hope to convince you that everything is going to be okay, that the good will triumph, because we need to hear that right now, because right now it feels like the bad guys are winning. What I will say is this, we do have heroes in this country. Our past has shown us that, and our present proves it still. People who refused to be corrupted, people who spoke truth to power, people who copied hard drives and leaked documents to reporters, civil groups and opposition parties who battled for the rule of law in hundreds of different court cases, and the judges who applied the rule of law without fear or favor. Those are heroes. There is no room for spectators anymore in this society. If you are not speaking up, you are complicit. If you are tolerating the corruption around you, you are corrupt. If you are content to allow massive inequality to continue in our society without trying to take on the cause that civil groups have done, then you are part of the problem. We cannot afford to stop fighting for the democracy that so many thousands of people have died for. We cannot think that it's okay for a severely wounded man, child, woman to die in a minibus taxi on the way to Middle Bog when they could have lived if they'd been able to walk two minutes to a clinic in Hendrina. State capture is not just an irritating litany of how poli the politically connected can loot without consequence. We actually need to realize that at the most profound level, the most heartbreaking level, the most real level, it is a killing thing. And we have to fight it because of that. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Um, I think Professor Shwela would be happy to hear that I am an alumni of Stellenbosch University. I uh, started that in Stellenbosch uh, um, Journalism School back in 2009, so it feels a little bit like a homecoming today, Chris sitting in front of you. Um, I think as Karen's story uh, just very um, poignantly indicated, the fact that individuals and business entities like the Guptas and other capitalists in this country are not known for their contribution to, to South African society. Um, in fact, most of the time it seems the, that the overall uh, idea and philosophy behind their business endeavors in South Africa is to extract as much as they possibly can, leaving in their wake uh, a trail of, of destruction and pain and devastation. Um, but I think there is one thing that the Guptas and other captives like them have positively contributed to South Africa and that is to enrich at least our uh, political um, vocabulary. <laughs> it is thanks to the, the Gupta family that we now have phrases and terms like the Zuptas, <laughs> and most importantly, state capture in our political discourse. Um, and I, I, I kind of think that it's very important for us to continuously um, define this term, state capture, that has not so prominently entered our political discourse since around 2016. Because state capture is not ordinary corruption. Um, and I think we have to very clearly define the difference between the two. Um, and I usually, I, I like to hone in on a couple of real developments in the, the broader Gupta saga to, to highlight the difference between what we would deem to be ordinary corruption and, and state capture. And I like to go back to 23 October 2015, would have been around noon, when two men sat down for a meeting at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Rosebank, Johannesburg. Then Deputy Finance Minister, Mkwebisi mm -hmm. Jonas, would not have suspected that when, it, when he had agreed to meet Dibizani Zuma, President Jacob Zuma's most economically active son, he would set in motion a chain of events that would have far-reaching implications, not only for himself, but for the entire country. After a little awkward chit-chat, the young Zuma told Jonas that the hotel was too crowded. The business that Zuma wanted to discuss with the Deputy Finance Minister required a more private place, explained Zuma Jr. Jonas was taken by the Dizani to a gated compound in a leafy suburb not far from the hotel. A property he would soon learn belonged to the infamous Gupta family. The rest is a key part of the Gupta's now very familiar history 
controversial arms deal figure Fanashtam Wane joined up with Jonas and Dilizani. And the three of them met with Ajay Gupta inside one of the residences, where the eldest of the Gupta trio offered Jonas a staggering 600 million rand if he agreed to take over from Shansha Nene as finance minister. Jonas, of course, declined the offer, and his experiences would later surface in the media, ushering in a wave of state capture revelations involving the Guptas. I'm often asked what the difference is between state capture and corruption, and like I said earlier, I think this snippet from the broader Gupta saga clearly illustrates the difference. Corruption, unlike state capture, is a short-term endeavor. It denotes short-term or once-off interactions between individuals and entities, whereby somebody is paid or gratified in some manner in exchange for doing something that would benefit the person or entity doing the gratification. A criminal, for instance, could pay a police officer to make an investigation docket disappear. Or a mining company could take a once-off chance and pay officials at the Department of Mineral Resources to, the mining, to deny the mineral rights applications of some of its rival mines. Now, these two examples, unfortunately, are real cases that I've come across in my, my line of work. But state capture, on the other hand, is a more enduring, sustained, and more structured form of corruption, one with a much longer lifespan. If graft could be likened to relationships, corruption would be like a one-night stand, while state capture is like a marriage. If the company that paid the GMR officials start making a habit of doing so in order to sabotage its competitors on an ongoing basis, that department has been captured. The captor and the captive become long-term bedmates in a sustained and mutually beneficial coexistence, a coexistence that is grounded in crooked conduct. When Ajay Gupta tried to persuade Jonas to become the new finance minister, he did so with the intention of securing the long-term loyalty of the National Treasury's most senior official. Jonas would have ensured that the Guptas were treated favorably by the gatekeepers of the country's public purse, not only for the purposes of one or two dodgy contracts, but on an ongoing basis. The Guptas, of course, have taken state capture, state capture to an even higher level. Instead of merely gratifying individuals in key departments or state-owned entities to encourage them to do their bidding. They've actually managed to insert some of their very own associates onto the boards of the government entities from which they derive the most financial benefits. Now, this has been true of ESCOM and of Transnet and Denel, and as we learn more and more about the state capture network, probably a couple of other state-owned companies we haven't even learned of yet. This phrase, state capture, has rightly entered our collective vocabulary as a result of the Gupta's antics. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be wary of other powerful interest groups, families and corporations who derive great financial advantages as a result of disconcertingly close ties to those in government, especially those who have a say in how taxpayers' money is spent. As I write in the Republic of Gupta, Zuma has many close friends who seem to be disproportionately successful when it comes to securing those big government contracts. There are also many other senior government officials who maintain similar relationships with people in the private sector. Given Zuma's questionable stance on the bond between his party and those doing business with the state, it should come as no surprise to us that this symbiosis has become increasingly predatory in nature during his tenure as president. It was Zuma, after all, who in 2013 told guests at the ANC's 101st anniversary gala dinner that, and I quote him, a wise business person will support the ANC because supporting the ANC means you're investing very well in your business. When Zuma again touched on the topic in a speech at a dinner hosted by the ANC's Progressive Business Forum in October 2015, our president's message had morphed into something that was at once desperate and menacing. I always say to business people that if you invest in the ANC, you are wise. If you don't invest in the ANC, your business is in danger, Zuma told the audience that day. Zuma's utterances are a clear indication that there is a fundamental flaw in what many of our most senior government leaders consider to be proper, above-board relations between business and government. Zuma is effectively saying that businesses will only stand a realistic chance of winning government tenders 
if they financially support the ANC. If that doesn't constitute corruption and the paying of kickbacks, then I really don't know what does. In an environment where government bases its procurement decisions on the benefits that it can expect to derive from the winning bidder, one will almost always end up with a situation where tender laws and regulations are bent and broken in order to favor the most pro-ANC bidders. The most unfortunate characteristic of such a procurement environment is that government end up, ends up appointing not the most cost-effective, competitive, and competent service providers, but instead merely the ones who are most willing to pour cash into the ruling party's coffers. That is how we end up buying trains that are too tall. This is how textbooks don't get delivered to the most impoverished and disenfranchised children in our schooling system. And this is how a state-owned power utility spends billions of rands on coal that doesn't even meet the minimum quality requirements, thereby putting our entire electricity, electricity network, and by extension, our entire economy in jeopardy. While the Gupta state capture exploits only really started to bear fruit during the tenure of President Jacob Zuma, I went to some length in my book to explain that the family had been cultivating state capture plans long before Zuma entered the union buildings. The Gupta's wholesale takeover of Cricket South Africa is another good case study to illustrate how the Gupta's capture endeavors did not only start once their friend became president. It provides, it provides us with startling insights into how the Guptas execute their capture strategies in order to take full control of an organization, whether it be a sports administration body, the board of an important state-owned company, or the office of the president of South Africa. What started out with acquiring the naming rights to South Africa's most beloved cricket grounds, including Newlands um, here in Cape Town, culminated in a situation that saw the Guptas exercised so much control within Cricket South Africa that they could summon members of the CSA board to the infamous Saxon World Estate on the eve of board meetings. Not to mention the detour of more than 3,000 kilometers that the likes of Mackay and Dini, Jacques Cullis and Graham Smith had to endure when the Guptas dragged the Pratiyas to Saharanpur, their hometown in India, during the national team's tour to the subcontinent in 2005. It is almost as if Cricket South Africa served as a bit of a test run, and you'll bottom my pun there, for the grand capture schemes that the Guptas would later put in motion. The Cricket South Africa board members and cricket stars that initially frequented the Saxon World Estate would later make way for top level government officials and even the president of our country. Another chapter of my book that deals with the Guptas' early days in South Africa, one that has caused a bit of controversy, deals with how the Guptas weren't exactly unfamiliar with the administration of former President Tavum Beghi. In this chapter, I detail how the eldest of the Gupta trio, Ajay, was roped in by the administration of former President Mbeki to serve in an advisory council known as a consultative council. If ever the historical revisionist, Mbeki has come out to strongly deny this revelation, but apart from labeling it as fake news, there was little substance in the former president's protestation, protestations. It was Dr. Isop Pahad, a minister in Mbeki's Eswell cabinet, who, after some patient prodding, finally admitted to me that Ajay Gupta had indeed been included in the Consultative Council around 2006. Also mentioned in the chapter is a reference made by a former Gupta associate to regular business meetings that the Guptas used to have with Mbeki right here in Cape Town, because that their Constantia residence. In light of such indications of at least some contact between Mbeki and the Guptas, I find Mbeki's refusal to admit to having any ties to the family whatsoever both curious and suspicious. The picture of a smiling Ajay Gupta alongside Mbeki, as included in the book, with Atul Gupta looking on in the background, pours more cold water over Mbeki's <coughs> argument that the Guptas were total strangers to him. Sometimes a picture is indeed worth a thousand words. I kind of view the um, revelations and information around the Gupta ties to Mbeki as, as rather important, seeing as we had this notion that the, uh, the state capture exploits were really only put into place once Jacob Zuma entered the union buildings. But I think instead what this shows is that the, that the family had a much um, the, the, the family state capture antics had a much longer run up, you know, one that certainly started to be, um, you know, started to be, uh, uh, was formulated 
when Atul Gupta, the Mughal Gupta's son, landed in South Africa in 1993. But that's enough history for today. I think like uh, my colleague Karen, I also largely remain positive about South Africa's prospects. I think that that positivity is rooted in a couple of factors and indications that have come to the fore thanks to of the gross abuses by the likes of the Guptas and other captives. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of a team of investigative journalists that worked on a project called the Gupta Leaks uh, since about March this year. Um, my colleagues at Amamungani and Daily Maverick um, and us have uncovered and been able to um, prov provide further detail to what we'd earlier known to be a criminal enterprise run by the Gupta family in association with President Jacob Zuma and some of his family members. Now, some of these indications and new uh, revelations, of course, were depressing and frightening. But I think what, what the whole saga also showed is that South Africa's resilient and strong media, along with a strong um, private sector and civil society um, sector, can actually make a difference in this country. There has been little fallout um, in terms of the Gupta leaks when it comes to criminal prosecution and proper investigations by the likes of the Hawks. Um, I always joke and say that the Hawks is a very unfortunate symbol because they neither have wings nor claws. Um, but the, the flip side of that coin has been the, the fallout in the private sector at least. Large multinational companies and local companies that have been ensnared in the, the wider Gupta um, state capture network <coughs> have all been forced, after having been revealed um, or having been exposed by the Gupta leaks, have been forced to, to take rather dramatic steps. And this includes companies like McKinsey and SAP um, and, and some of the German companies that, that, did, that did business with Transit and ESCOM through the Guptas. So there has been some fallout at least. I think at the end of the day, too, <coughs> South Africans in general resilience um, has also been very positive. I was part of a group of people who gathered outside the Gupta compound earlier this year when there were state capture um, protests happening all across the country. And I think that that basically showed that you know, <coughs> South Africans can sometimes pull together and show their discontent with the, the rabid abuses that we've seen over the last couple of years. I think President Jacob Zuma and his cohorts would like us to believe that this disapproval of this kind of you know, governance is something that kind of only resides in upper middle class households. Um, and I think we, we are increasingly starting to see that this is not the case. I think South Africans are increasingly collectively making a decision that this country cannot forever be ruled by shady characters who reside in leafy suburbs, suburbs such as Saxonville. Thank you very much. Mm. Other side of a table like this, so. <laughs> different experience. Um, I think firstly, you know, I, you know the, the, the one thing I always like to highlight in terms of the, the Gupta Leaks project is the wonderful and unprecedented sort of, uh, you know, nature of this project. You know, here for the first time you had a team of 14 investigative journalists, you know, and investigative journalists, first, firstly, is a very rare breed in South Africa, unfortunately. So given um, you know the, the, the amount of resources and time that, that goes into this form of journalism, but the Gupta Leaks pulled together a, a bunch of journalists, about 14 journalists by my last count, from media platforms that would normally have been competitive with one another. You know, we that's a, a one characteristic of the industry. You know, we all we are very competitive. We we like outdoing one another. And hopefully that competition actually also spur, spurs on reporting that is of a quality and of a nature that ultimately benefits the country. But having said that, you know, I think the, the original recipients of this trove of information very wisely decided that the, 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 the extent and the size of this data leak was too large for one media organization to handle alone. Very uh, prudently decided to uh, make this a cooperative project between News24, uh, Amabungani and, and Daily Maverick which I think was really um, a very heartening process. I think it also showed, you know, the, 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 uh, that afforded us the ability to, at a very quick rate, get to the heart of the, you know, the details contained in those documents. Um, so I think that, that was the, the kind of like the most endearing 
positive aspect that that will always remain with me definitely from the process, you know. Um, and I, hopefully that kind of cooperation is, is something that doesn't stop with the Gupta Lynch. You know, I think it definitely benefited the country as a whole. Um, in terms of what is yet to come from the Gupta Leagues, look, it, it's definitely the trove that we have access to now. I mean, it is a finite set of information, certainly. Um, we are working through it, and I think if it, um, if you can do a little bit of a, a curve on it, it's definitely one that's got a downwards tra tra trajectory at the moment. Um, so the reporting from the Gupta Leagues itself um, will become less frequent, certainly as we, you know, start nearing the end of the of our sifting through the trove of documents. But um, what will not end this is Gupta related information because this kind of reporting always has a snowball effect. You know, we can we can report on details about money from a free state government project be, being siphoned through Gupta shell companies in Dubai and that, that would have primarily have emanated from the Gupta leaks themselves. But then we start getting information from whistleblowers again. You know, people who have information to add to that story and so the, the process kind of just grows and grows and grows. Um, have the Guptas really sold their businesses? I, I, be, I believe on the surface they have. They certainly have parted ways with a lot of their shareholding in some of these key companies, including the get up, um, and 7 the process is underway and so on. But I think that formally um, that the Guptas work in that regard doesn't mean much anymore. We've seen now that with proxies, people who have no formal business association with the Guptas into certain business situations where they did end up deriving great financial benefit from. Um, once again, you can look at some of these shell companies in Dubai. I mean, there's, there's no clear um, business link between a company like JJ Trading, it's one of the shells that reaps some of the, the kickbacks from the transit contracts. But then, somehow, some of the proceeds of these kickbacks then end up in Gupta-owned companies in Dubai accounts. So. I would be very surprised if they actually have closed their, their money taps in South Africa completely. I really doubt that. I think they, they've got enough um, rent-seeking contracts and projects in place in South Africa that they don't even actually formally <coughs> carry their name or their signature. So I think that the milking certainly is continuing, unfortunately. Further questions? You had your Yes, my friend was up. Uh, in fact, I wanted to ask Peter, <coughs> would, you, would you say in your opinion that the Guptas are now under siege, uh, given the reaction of some of the international companies and some institutions? Thank you. Thank <coughs> Thank you very much. My question is, firstly, my name is Andy Letema Letukon. I'm from New York. Uh, firstly, to me, it came a little bit of a surprise, Dr. Dick, I must say that. Here, I was expecting to talk about the state capture entirely, but now it was closed off to the Guptas and the Zuptas. <laughs> but nonetheless, with that being said, my question is that now we're approaching a, a process where there's going to be a state capture commission. What part do you also think that must be included into that so that we can get the full view of the state capture? Thank you very much. One more. Yeah. One more. Yeah. All right. Let's just get the. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity. The, the question is for both of you. Uh, the proceeds of the state capture, the laundered money, the crooked deals, is there anybody left in the Criminal Justice Administration or the Treasury or indeed the Reserve Bank who could be trusted to try and pull back some or all of the proceeds of this criminal enterprise? On the state capture inquiry, that inquiry was recommended in terms of Tuli Madanseda's report, which centered around the issue of uh, apparent violations of the president's code of ethics in terms of his relationship with the Guptas. 
and the very specific allegation that he had essentially uh, you know, undermined his own constitutional man mandate by outsourcing what is a presidential function under the constitution to a family. And so I think the apprehension is that the president's insistence on trying to frame the term of reference for this is to make it as broad as possible. So the urgent issue which needs to be defined, whether or not this family, and there's ample evidence of this, is controlling key state appointments in terms of SOEs, ministers, that needs to be resolved as soon as possible because that is a, an urgent and continuous threat to the country. I think the threat, the potential of this turning into a broad thing that looks at state capture since you know, an, an undisclosed time in the past will weaken that inquiry. And it's also not what Tuli Manansela asked for. So it would be a violation of the relief that she sought in the report, and it's not legally sustainable. On the issue of um, the Tegeta and whether the Guptas have actually sold um, or not, the people, the sort my sources within Hendrina have been have told me that that in fact they have been told that that mine will continue, but it will be owned by someone else, and that, that no one must be concerned because essentially it was still a Gupta business. The Guptas have no search, no choice but to disassociate themselves from their business interests. They have no bank accounts here. Yeah? The Bank of Baroda litigation is still ongoing. They're desperately trying to stop that last account from being closed. The bank itself says, look, we can't, we can't manage your accounts. It's, legally, it's almost legally impossible for them to continue doing business as so-called Gupta companies in South Africa. So they need desperately to get rid of those companies or, as, as Peter Louis has pointed out, um, utilize proxies in order to keep operating them. So that is, that is a pretty central issue. On, on the issue of whether we think they are state institutions, I mean, if you read Jacques Poe's book, it's absolutely staggering in terms of the allegations that are being made. I've spoken to Yolisa Matakata, who is the head of the Hawks, who Johan Boysen has actually said he does have faith in. And she has assured me that they are trying their absolute level best to get to grips with the Gupta leak emails and with state capture revelations. That being said, however, what has been documented in Poe's book and in the report done by those academics around um, the way in which state capture has happened has shown that there has been a concerted hollowing out of, of institutions like the NPA and Hawks. So to be honest, I don't know if the skills exist within those environments to do those investigations. We saw these staggering um, averments made in the Prasa litigation where they said, uh, you know, that Popo Malefe said that he was told by the Hawks that they did not have capacity to do forensic investigation, that they have spent in the region of over 100 million rand to investigate massive tender irregularities, maladministration, and potential corruption at Prasa. So it may be that there is the will, but is there the skill? I don't know. Um, what is very difficult for the Guptas and those enterprises at the moment is that the FBI is now involved, the American authorities are involved, and having dealt in a very peripheral way with how those entities operate, if they find that there is evidence, uh, they will persist for 20, 30 years if they have to, to make sure that justice is done. And the FBI are terriers. So it would have actually been in the Gupta's interests for South African law enforcement to deal with this rather than outside entities. And I think the lesson to learn here is that when malfeasance occurs, when there is this kind of uh, endemic maladministration and potential corruption, if you think that you, you can put a, keep a lid on it in a global environment such, such as what we have at the moment, you are very, very uh, sorely mistaken. Um, yeah, I, I, th that was so well said. That, um, I'm not going to latch anything onto the, the formal questions, the three questions. I just want to kind of comment on, on, um, on Dile, your, your first um, you know, observation earlier that we're kind of honing in on the Guptas and only discussing the Guptas and so on. I think that that's a very, a very valid point. You know, I think, if anything, um, the, the um, exposure of the Guptas and their kind of uh, capture networks should hopefully be the, the start of our ongoing grappling with this issue of state capture, definitely. And I think the Guptas definitely deserve special scrutiny. Look, they, they are a special case in terms of state capture. <laughs> Zuma and other individuals in government, you know, in government, they do have their special ties with an array of other people. I mean, Jacques Rose's book highlights the one million rand a month payment 
that Durban businessman Roy Brutley was so kind to pay the president in the earlier part of his presidency. Um, but having said that, you know, we haven't yet come across other examples where literally, you know, where, where other, uh, another family or businessman has the goal and audacity to summon the likes of Mkwebisi Jonas and Faiki Mentor and Temba Maseko and those government officials to their home and kind of basically tell them that we are putting you in this cabinet position and this is what is expected of you. So they, they do certainly seem to have occupied a very special place in this capture hierarchy, but certainly let this be the start of unearthing other capture networks as well. Thank you. Zora. I'll just quickly touch on the first one with regards to yeah, this kind of renewed commitment and dedication to, to you know fostering good journalism. And I think you know to an extent that has been the case, definitely. I think um, since around you know 2015, 2016, 2017, you know, that era of um, very important revelations and work having come through the media, you know, in terms of the process stuff. Um, and the life is said in many, you know, that was a scandal that was brought to, you know, to the forefront by the media. And now the, the ongoing revelations around the Gupta family. I, I think for one, you know, my, my personal experience is that within my own environment, uh, professional environment, there is kind of this renewed commitment to, to ensuring that this kind of journalism, you know, is supported and encouraged and, and nurtured, basically. So I, I really hope that it is something, you know, on, on an ongoing basis that can be achieved. That is also, unfortunately, also something, hopefully fortunately, something that requires the buy-in and support of the public at large, you know. Um, so I think, we, okay, we obviously, you know, we work at a, a for-profit kind of model, uh, that's at least 24 is on. But there are other uh, means to support this kind of journalism as well, you know, where you have non-profits like Amabungani and Scorpio and such, who, who basically require the ongoing support of, of uh, members of you know society of the public. So yeah, that's that's my, my comment on that. Um, pre nineteen ninety four, there was certainly uh, capture without a doubt. And I would really recommend that you, you buy the book Apartheid Guns and Money by an author called Henny van Thielen. Off to buy my book first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and John's book. But um, van Thielen <coughs> in a very well-researched book um, lays out these kind of <coughs> capture networks that the National Party government used to have in place back in the day. And I think sadly, to, to some extent, that has left a very, um, very usable blueprint uh, for, for those who, who took power after 1994. Um, so no, definitely not. It's, it's not we shouldn't kid ourselves that, you know, the the advent of, the, um, of corruption is one that, that only occurred with the rise in power of the, the ANC led government. Yeah, affirmative action and VE. I've, I've got a, um, I'm very critical of the process because, and this is once again going back to practical, my practical experience in the field. In the PRASA, my work on PRASA in, in about 2015, 2016, so PRASA was basically, the, there were a couple of big contracts, but foremost was the, the contracts for the new locomotives and the, the, car, the passenger trains, um, which eventually went to Alstom, the French manufacturer. That's a 50 billion rand contract. And it's a contract that certainly held the promise of spurring on um, and encouraging local uh, production and local companies. And that's certainly how the, the contract was sold to South Africa, much in the same way as the earlier uh, arms procurement contracts were sold to South Africa. You know, these kind of offsets benefits that were supposedly going to happen in the country. And my saddest observation from all of that was the fact that I came across a black owned business people and companies um, who were legitimate companies, who were startups and who, were, who had put in place um, infrastructure <coughs> and products that could actually have serviced this gigantic contract. But then what happens in our current model? The cronies get the contracts. They get the primary contracts and they get the, the, the secondary contracts from these kind of deals. So in that sense, BE, ironically, is now sidelining legitimate black business people as well. Thank you. Um, if you read Jacques Poe's book, you'll read about, I think it was called Operation Impy. What was, yeah. Where basically Jeremy Berry, who is from the Cape Flats, investigated how police had taken weapons that were supposed to be destroyed um, in a weapon destruction process 
and sold them back to gangsters. And those weapons resulted in the deaths of over 1,000 uh, people, many of whom were little children. Now, I might, you might say to me, well, what's the point of the people of the Cape Flats knowing that their children were killed with police guns? It's important. Truth is important. I think one of the biggest mythologies that people who are against the forces of democracy in this country want to believe is that we are insignificant and that the truth doesn't matter. But it does. Because it matters for that two-year-old that was gunned down in the street in Bonte Hill. It matters for her family. It matters to know who is responsible for this and how must they take responsibility. You may tell us that what we're doing is absolutely futile, nothing will change, nothing matters, but things do change. We saw institutions like KPMG admit, look, we got it wrong on this rogue report. We saw SAP um, taking responsibility. We saw you know, massive demonstrations of, of civil society. We saw you know, litigation. South Africans are not passive about this country, and they shouldn't be, because there is something worth saving here. Um, truth, you know, the, the, I think what Peter Louis said about, we learned how to do this nonsense from apartheid. The looting that occurred in apartheid was extreme. We still don't know the full extent of it, but as that gentleman just pointed out, with a minister who was getting him to sign off on a tender which, of which he was a direct beneficiary, there was a blueprint for, for corruption. We can't pretend that like, oh, it just came out of the air when the Guptas got on that plane in 1993. It wasn't. It's always been here. But does that make it okay? No. I'm not going to stand here and say, oh no, we can accept it because they're poor people and they're suffering and to focus on that above other things is, is simply not effective. The fact of the matter is, the poorest of the poor deserve, like all of us do, a government that has authoritative moral leadership. Yes, you are right, most governments are corrupt, well, pretty much all of them. But it, when it gets to the extent of people <coughs> dictating who they want for finance minister, and a man who, I'm sorry, you know, having dealt with him, Des Van Royen, for four days, the weekend special, being in control of the finances of that company, of the company, country, walking in with two people who have been appointed by the Guptas to advise him, how can that not be an urgent sense of crisis for us? Because then we've stopped pretending that you know there's any kind of legitimacy to our state. Our president has then acceded his constitutional mandate to run the country, and that can never be okay. Not for the poorest of the poor, not for the richest of the rich, not for anyone. It's not okay. I, I absolutely agree with that sentiment. You know, and I think um, it's, it's, it's very easy to make corruption or to turn corruption into something that's going to detach from our, our lived reality, you know, something that we experience every day. But I mean, if you want to bring it down to the practical level, you know, if, if we don't go as a media, we write exposés and books about issues like cross up, uh, buying trains that don't work, um, spending billions of rands to, um, to benefit connect, uh, connected cronies, basically, in corrupt deals, then those communities on the Cape Flat, you know, the Ravensmeets and the Ponte Evils and the Mitchells Plains and those kind of communities, they don't have access to desperately needed uh, public uh, transport that can actually give them an opportunity to access the formal, um, you know, the formal economy and the formal job opportunities. That's just one little small thing. I mean, we can go on and on that the media, it's thanks to the media that, you know, you know about something like life is city many. So thanks to the media's reporting that we know that 113 people died because our callous government didn't care enough to move them into proper facilities. Oh, 141 now, I'm sorry. Um, and on and on it goes. It's the media that informed you about our president's um, abuses at Nkandla. You take our taxpayers' money, and build himself a palace in, in the um, Kwasi Natal um, Platteland. So I, I absolutely think it differ. I think the media is playing a very, very vital role in informing people in this country and creating a roadmap for us in terms of um, you know addressing these these uh, yeah this this corruption and these abuses of the public funds. Thank you, Peter. All right. Um, okay, I, I, I think we should deal with this issue of basically what the, the media chooses to report on. Um, 
and the yeah, I think what what is kind of widely deemed as this uh, negative news slant, you know, the, the, the preference for negative news. And you know, I can I can I'm, I'm not a uh, a student of media theory, you know, so I'm not going to uh, provide you with a broad answer on how the media reflects society, because you know we are a, a mirror that holds up, you know, what's what's going on in society. But from my personal vantage point, um, what I can tell you is that we firstly have limited resources. Um, and that, that is coupled with the fact that investigative journalism, first and foremost, is a, a guardian against the abuse of uh, things like public funds, you know, abuses by powerful people. So in, in that sense, you know, it's, it's very difficult for us to uh, pour any time and effort into projects that aren't in the public interest in terms of ensuring that um, the plundering of state coffers, for instance, is halted. That, that is where our primary focus lies at this stage, because we view that as, what, what, if, you, if you really break it down, you know, and sort of deconstruct what the media does, we hope to have a positive impact on society by halting things like corruption. Um, and absolutely, you know, it's a, it's a feel-good story to go and report on a community project that is successful, and I hope there would be, you know, media coverage of such projects, but, you know, personally, from, from where I stand, we kind of view it as a much more prudent and important project to, to go after people who are stealing our money under our noses. Um, yes, the current finance minister, Mr. Gigaba, uh, I, I do write about him in my book. He certainly has his ties to the Gupta family. There is a, a trio of former intelligence bosses who left the state security agency um, in around 2012-2013 after they had started looking into the Gupta family, and that's actually before the watershed moment of the Walter Cliff landing in 2013. They actually started their probe in about 2010, when they were informed of the, what appeared to be very um, suspiciously close ties between government officials and the Gupta family. And these three individuals, it was Gibson, Jenje, uh, Mo Sheikh, and a oh, third individual I can't recall right now, and they, they in, in uncertain terms, they compiled a list, they did a thorough study of the family, and one of the government officials on that list who was known to have frequented the Gupta Saxon World compound was Malusi Gigaba. Um, so the ties had been there quite early on. We have not yet found any money pouring into a shell company of these. We have not found any indications of him having accepted bribes from the Gupta family. But the circumstantial evidence at this stage does paint a very concerning picture. When Gigaba was Minister of Public Enterprises, he presided over companies such as ESCOM and Transnet and such, obviously, and it was during that tenure, coincidentally or not, that the most ferocious capture happened in those companies. That is when literally in his, during his, on his watch, and I mean, he, he had to have been privy to this because the boards of these companies are checked and approved by the, by the minister of that department. It was during this tenure that companies like Transit and ESCOM <coughs> were flooded with board members with real and provable ties to the Gupta family. Not some, you know, vague um, friendships and stuff like that. Literally, fellow directors of other companies business partners, people who had close ties to Salim Issa and other associates in the broader kind of Gupta business network. And I think for that mere fact, you know, Minister Gikaba does have a case to answer to you. Yeah, I remember that famous quote, I go to Dubali with the Guptas, but a lot of people do, and we were like, no, we don't. Um, the other thing to remember just on this last question is that, you know, we often think that um, corruption or state capture corruption is me giving bribe A to Minister B, but it's not that, it's not. It's the more, the, the more profound complexion of, of state capture um, is that you have people who, in terms of competence, or, or aptitude for a particular position would never get that position. But they get it, and they're there to serve the interests of that family, and they tie their career trajectory to that family. And I think that argument could be made powerfully for Des van Rooyen, and I think that argument could be made for, for Minister Zwane. In terms of, of Gigaba, I think you know what he does in terms of this nuclear deal, and his constant claims that this will not go ahead if it is not what the country can afford, 
that's that's going to be what what he actually does with those utterances. I think will be a, a real um, test for him. On that thing of, of positive news reporting, I think you are incredibly right, and I think part of what we actually need to do is is highlight people who are doing their jobs, who are putting out there, going out in communities and, and doing the right thing and, and serving serving the interests of the people. And I mean, I recently went to um, Paul Aquane to profile um, a young woman, Dr. Nechituni, who is the, the first um, black African female oncologist working in a pediatric ward in Limpopo and literally saving the lives of little children with cancer. And it was amazing to go out there and meet this woman who, and there are so many, many like her. And that's why your point about BE and corruption, it's not the same thing. There are so many incredible human beings in this country. People who have come from incredible circumstances of growing up with the, the, the consequences and the lived reality of structured racism and apartheid and still managed to come out and, and be part of a democratic society, contribute, do amazing things. And I think that is what you know, it is important that we focus on those things in terms of bringing, bringing um, hopefulness. What you were saying about your community and the advent of, of corporates trying to take over in, in small um, disimp disimpoverished impoverished areas, I think that is a massive issue and globally it's a massive issue. And there are projects like Reclaim the City, there is pushback. But you know, the consequences of living in a country where, where corruption and where there isn't appropriate fiscal control of the budget is that that gap between the rich and the poor widen all the time. And my greatest fear is that, um, you know, and I know I'm going off on a tangent here, I did a story for Checkpoint about the fact that children between the ages of 10 and 14, the suicide rate has doubled over the last 15 years. And I did a story about a nine-year-old boy who was constantly having to try and get food from the school, trying to get food from relatives, didn't know where his next meal would go, come from, who'd hanged himself on a tree in the school. And when I went and spoke to the, to the um, counselor from the Department of Education, he said to me, Karen, in my little area, um, in Placeni, I think it was called, in the last five years, I've been to the funerals of 60 children who have killed themselves. So, you know, that for me was massively convicting because those little kids, the conditions on which people are being forced to live in this country, 54% of the population are proving so overwhelming that they are hanging themselves from, their tree, from trees, that they are drinking ratics, that they are drinking the most terrible things because they don't want to be in the world anymore. And it's the exact kind of issues that you're raising. Finally, on your point um, around you know, racketeering laws, I mean, POCA was, was fairly new legislation. I mean, it's not that new any, anymore. Um, you know, we haven't, <coughs> it was actually President Jacob Zuma, I think, at one stage was going to face a racketeering charge in terms of the, the ultimately aborted, now controversial uh, corruption case. I don't know that we don't have the law. I think we do have the law. I think it's just a case of how is it enforced. You know, it's the same with our amazing constitution, which, which recognizes the rights, for instance, of gay people, yet there are lesbian, black lesbian women in townships who get brutally murdered. You know, there's a disconnect between what our law says, what our constitution says, and what is happening in reality.